Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to take you on a journey through Northern Europe to explore what climate adaptation strategies and measures could mean um, to, um, to protect historic places uh, from the impacts of climate change, or maybe not protect them. Um, the project um, is undertaken as part of Adapt Northern Heritage, a project um, for the Northern, funded by the Northern Periphery Arctic Programme. And I'm working here with colleagues from Iceland, Ireland, um, Scotland, Norway, um, um, Sweden and Russia. And, and specifically um, for this presentation, I would like to acknowledge um, my colleagues from Riks Antikvar, Riks Antikvar Limited, uh, Minas Stockholm Islands, and the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage Research. I myself work for Historic Environment Scotland, and that's the lead public body um, for the Historic Environment in Scotland. We are quite unique in a European context in that we are not only managing a designation and heritage protection system, but we're also looking after 336 historic sites spread across Scotland, as you can see on the map here. Um, plus, we undertake research, we do archaeological recording, and we do outreach and training courses. And as, as, as part of our research, we're participating in Adapt Northern Heritage. I would like to introduce the project briefly to you, including our, our project structure and activities. But then we quickly focus um, on on the adaptation planning guidance we are developing as part of this project. And to do that, um, I'll show you 10, 10 sites in Northern Europe um, and outline how I could see how we could um, categorize, group these different approaches to, to adaptation strategies. The project itself aims at helping communities and local governments um, to, to explore what climate change could mean for the sites they're looking after. And, and help them to plan for, for the adaptation of their sites, for protecting these sites to climate change impacts. And the project runs for three years until 2020 and is funded by the European Union, Iceland and Norway through the Interact Programme for the Northern Periphery and Arctic, as well as the four project partners um, who mentioned us. Um, but actually our consortium is much bigger. We've got um, 15 partners spread across um, Northern Europe um, ranging from local governments to national um, national bodies like Historic Environment Scotland, um, but also small-scale community organisations and universities. Um, equally, our, our nine case studies are, are spread across across the north of Europe. I should say that the, the case studies you see or the examples you see in our journey in a minute um, are not just project case studies. So I'm, I'm wiping the scope a little bit here. And the outputs are threefold. We are developing guidance, a tool to, to help communities assess their places and then start planning um, their, their conservation. Um, we, we try to demonstrate these tools at nine case studies that will hopefully lead to action plans in the end. And last but not least, we, we help um, setting up a community network so that people can, can share their ideas, learn from each other. Um, we, we finished the first year of our project already and, and that was focused on developing guidance on how to assess climate change impacts for our place. And we've been busy this summer trialing our nine, nine case studies and um, this guidance working with, with local communities. Um, what I want to focus on in the next couple of slides is, is our adaptation guidance we are developing on the, in the now forthcoming year. Um, and of course, we will factor in the climate change impacts that we like to, to include in this also discussion about uncertainties and time horizons. Surely, cultural significance and the condition of a place will feature, um, but we're also keen on, on understanding what the socioeconomic value of a place is and how that would factor into a feasibility study for adaptation strategies. But in the following, I would like to concentrate on adaptation strategies and, and explore how we can group them, categorize them. And for, for that, I would like to propose four domains. Um, firstly, we could look at activities. Um, so where are we in the, in the planning or understanding process of the place and the impacts it will, uh, will most likely receive? Um, is there a concept of strategy from the usual maintenance to altering a place, to managing damage or loss, 
or, or maybe to doing nothing, which might also be a, a strategy. Um, there's certainly a spatial component to it. Um, are, we, are we changing or are we doing something to the actual historic place or to the wider environment? Or maybe are we transferring something into the digital space? And of course, we also will look at the, the temporal context. Um, are measures implemented ad hoc or was there long term planning? But let's start our journey in Ireland on the, on the southwest coast of Ireland, on the Dingle Peninsula, um, with Donbeck Fort on, in County Kerry, um, which has unfortunately seen two, two quite dramatic um, cliff collapses, which have taken, taken down quite a bit of this promontory fort. Um, one was in 2014, uh, um, the last in January this year, um, always connected to winter storms um, to the degree that the fort is now no longer accessible and most likely will no longer um, um, be accessible in the future. Um, despite the Office of Public Works maintaining the fort, it has not been possible to stabilize the site. Um, I would mention, like to mention the, the Cherish project in this context, um, a sister project in the Interact um, project family, um, which is conducting or which has carried out LIDAR scanning um, at the site, which not only documents the site, but also helps us to understand how the process of erosion is taking place. Um, and the Cherish project, as well as a colleague of mine, will present tomorrow um, at the session already mentioned on climate change. So if you want to learn more about this, please come tomorrow. Um, moving on to Scotland, to Abergeldy Castle, um, uh, 16th century castle on the River Dee, which you can just see in the foreground. Um, the castle is listed, but so is the Iron Bridge going over the river here. Um, and that was the situation in 2015 when the, when the river suddenly burst its banks and took, took away all the, all the fall and all the embankment quite, um, quite surprisingly. I think nobody expected that. Um, so here's an example of, of a situation where, where we didn't anticipate um, such a huge impact and had to, had to very rapidly um, come up with a solution to protect the castle. It has to be privately owned, so it was also an issue of who would do the work, who would fund this. Um, you can, at the bottom right of the picture, just see the remains of the bridge. This, this little, little upstanding thing is all that is left of it. Um, moving on northwards um, into Norway, into the Arctic Ocean, um, on the island of Svalbard, they have a long history of mining, coal mining, where they took the, the um, coal out of the mountains and transported it through an aerial cableway system um, to the shoreline and um, built mostly of timber um, in, an, in a climate which was very cold and had permafrost to, to an area which is now um, experiencing the, the largest increases in temperature worldwide. Um, so how are we going to protect this, this heritage? And it's one of our case studies in the Dachlofen heritage. We were working with the, the regional authority to understand to what degree can we actually save these places? I mean, it's a huge cultural landscape. Um, will we be able to, to save everything or do we concentrate on, on certain parts? So we are, we are looking at our project here to develop a longer term strategy. Further south of Norway, um, another case study of our project is Ottenes, a historic farmstead, um, sitting, sitting on a mountain slope um, just off a, off a fjord. It's timberlock buildings, um, and they always have had problems with insect infestation, particularly woodworm. But we think that we can experience an increase of this woodworm, possibly due to, to higher temperatures. Um, so they have already a strategy of repairing, continuous repairing these buildings. But we would like to understand better what that will mean with, with climate projections. Can, can we sustain that into the future? Are there, are there better ways maybe of, of repairing these buildings? Back in Scotland, a quite um, controversial, um, at the time controversial, um, measure was housing in uh, uh, Pictish stone, um, highly decorative carved Pictish stone in, in Murray, in northern Scotland, a surrender stone, um, which, which experienced, um, uh, the, the decoration was fading due to weathering, um, but we also had problems with, with vandalism. And the decision was taken to, to keep it standing in its context, so not remove it in front of to a museum, but to protect it with a glass shutter that was in 2004. Um, and 
it's a longer term term project for us because we're also constantly monitoring um, the environmental conditions inside, and it seems to be working quite quite well. And last last Christmas has actually um, protected the storm from vandals. Vendel, um, the glass was smashed, but the storm survived. And we've also done lots of um, recording here, which is actually quite quite interesting in this context because we've got old records as well, so we can can compare the digital recording to, to historic um, drawings. Another project where we at Adapt Northern Heritage and Cherish are working together or alongside um, is Balance Gaelic. So we're back on the on the um, Kerry coastline in Ireland. Um, and it's a historic graveyard with a um, abbey ruin. Um, and this place has simply survived because the Office of Public Works in Ireland has put a massive, really massive concrete seawall um, along the shore of this place. Um, and and, and the, the ruin itself is very well protected, is, is very well um, maintained and repaired. Um, nonetheless, the sea has a huge impact on the site, um, throwing literally storms, throwing boulders onto the site, smashing, smashing graves and dislocating grave slabs, just, just to get an idea of the power of, of the sea at this place. The good news is, climate projections say there will be less storms. The bad news, they're going to get strong. So how do we, how do we adapt this site for the future? Um, I should mention that Cherish has also done a digital recording of the site here. My colleague uh, Mary Davis will talk tomorrow more about our risk screening, um, most coastal risks and flooding risks and landslides. Um, at our own um, estate of historic buildings and historic mum in Scotland. Um, Scarabray is one of our prime sites on the Orkney Islands, um, discovered during a storm, when, when a storm washed away a sand dune in the 1850s, I think, at least so the story goes. Um, and and the, the small image is what you normally see on, on the website. If you, if you scroll, scroll through better pictures, you actually see there's also a big concrete seawall, which is what protects the site. Um, so it's a quite a big effort for us to, to keep the site as it is. Um, we are, um, our own digital team is doing site recording there to understand how, how the coastline is changing, not just the seawall, but also the surrounding areas. So again, the longer term, term approach to, to the management of the site. I've put on the Coffner Stone also in Scotland, uh, near Glasgow, um, as an example of burial. Um, the, the big photograph you see here in black and white um, is the stone in the 1930s with uh, rock carvings. Um, it's, it's a rock outcrop with uh, prehistoric rock carvings. And the rock carvings are here highlighted with paint so you can, you can see them better. Um, but this stone was actually protected in the 1960s and it was simply buried. They just put lots of earth on the top of it and it was completely overgrown. So a few people knew where it was, but that was a way of protecting it from, from the weather, but also in this case from, from vandalism again. Um, it was excavated um, last year, um, just for a couple of days, so if, if you knew about it, if you were lucky, you could pop by and, and actually visit the stone, and the purpose was to record it, so to, to get, get a um, record which you could make visible for, for people once it is reburied, um, and it's now overgrowing again. So, so an interesting approach for me, because in Scotland we, we often think that we need to present our heritage to the public, um, but by showing it physically. And here we are actually hiding it away, but they are not protecting it. Um, back on Svalbard, so I'm jumping across the north and south a bit. Um, now going to relocation. It's, it's a, a nice project of the governor of Svalbard, um, um, hunting station, Fredham, um, which was very, very close to the sea, or the sea was encroaching and coming closer and closer. So they started lifting the buildings one by one and moved them further inland. Thinking back to the mining heritage of Swarbot, um, yes, you can move these houses, but would you be able to move the mining heritage inland? Would you lose context? And, and lastly, an example from northern Sweden, um, where we're working with the Sina project, another Interreg MPA project. <coughs> and the town of Warga on the Lofoten Islands um, is normally uh, thought of as the first city um, of northern Norway. Um, dated to medieval times. And as you see here in the photo, you don't see a city. It's long gone despite the, the fishing heritage having survived for quite a long time. 
and the project here, Cine Project, wants to bring back this this heritage using digital technology. So bringing back something which is lost or might be lost as an approach to to deal with yeah with, with impacts on the site. Sorry, I'm going wrong way. So to summarize, um, the project that Northern Heritage develops guidance for assessing and adapting or planning the adaptation of historic places. And we, we try and demonstrate these, these guidance at site -specific, um, in site-specific action plans for nine case studies. And we create a platform for stakeholders to, to engage. In this presentation, I was particularly looking at typologies for, for adaptation strategies and, and trying to reflect um, what activities and strategies could mean in, in, in that context and, and what spatial and temporal um, situations are. And if you can think of any anything I've missed, I have good uh, examples of adaptation and strategies, I would love to hear from you.